Okay, uh, I'm going to give me a great title, so <laughs> it's hard for me to talk about this uh, topic in 50 minutes, but I will try my best. But not looking to the future without looking into the past, huh? and I think we should not forget that that what we do when we talk about lengthening was already observed about 150 years ago. Langenbeck, everybody knows this Langenbeck hawk, observed that it is, will be much more important for the future that we can get bone growth by increased tension. He observed this after fracture treatment. When the load on the leg was a little bit too high, he observed that the leg was longer at the end. But he had the prognosis that that could be important, but he could not use it. Another pioneer was August Beer. Every anesthesiologist will know him because he was the inventor of the local anesthesiology. But he observed that into the blood of the hematoma in the fracture, there are all these growth cells which we need to get good bone. And he, his recommendation was, please do not remove the hematoma because then you remove all these growth cells. And also that is, I think, that is the biological factor of what we do. And of course, Elizarov, everybody knows I have not to talk about him. I had the chance to meet Elizarov in 1990, two years before he died in Helsinki. And I had the opportunity to talk about my first three cases with intramedullary lengthening with a Fitbond device. And then one, one man stand up and said, oh, Professor Lizarov, this young guy from Germany is talking about lengthening with a nail and you always talked us that you have to preserve the intramedullary vessels. How, what, what, how does it work? And Lizarov said only four words, it does not work. <laughs> that was the answer when I showed my cases. So that was the beginning of my career. But uh, you, you know, the work of Elizabeth was great and he teached us a lot, all what we are doing now about uh, external fixation and gradual distraction would not be possible without his work. But finally, everybody knows that something like this is not acceptable for us, especially in, uh, in Europe where people don't want to have such a fixator. So lengthening nails were, uh, coming and going and we had yesterday we had a whole uh, a lecture uh, several lectures about these different uh, nails and uh, you see some of them are still available some were only used and um, they were not used any, anymore because they were not working or they were too painful here there was a, a meeting in Baltimore 2002 and you see all the inventors uh, coming here that is uh, Paley and Herzenberg and all these inventors here like Guichet, Zuberon, unfortunately he died and Mark uh, uh, Kuhl and the chef of me and we had a great uh, discussion about these uh, different uh, nails. I'm a promoter of the Fitborn nail and what I, give, I want to ta uh, talk about in the next 10 minutes, it's not uh, only about the nail as a lengthening nail, I want to show you what can be done within 30 years of a development. <laughs> the fit bond is not a nail, it is a concept. A concept means that you can do a lot of things, not only bone lengthening. And the most important slide I showed already yesterday is that, that you never should forget all the principles what we learn here in our deformity courses when you have a nail in your hand. A na lengthening is only one part of the procedure. You have to restore the length, but in the same way you have to restore the axis and the torsion. All these things have to be uh, done at the end. The Fitbone is a very comfortable device. You can use it very easily. You have no um, big uh, control units, not heavy magnets. <coughs> so everybody of you are invited to use this system if you want. We have some procedures to learn it. And um, <coughs> you, you will see that it's easy if you, if you do it not only once a year. You will you'll see that it's a nice device. The three columns of the Fitborn concept are, one is the implant itself, it's a computerized motorized nail, and the planning method, we had a lecture about that yesterday, and the surgery with uh, instruments like you, you know from arthroscopy. I think the Fitborn system is known very well, it is fully implantable, it is like a distraction nail, the skin is closed, you have outside a, supp a power supply unit, and the motor will, can be activated um, as long as you want. 
The, the reverse planning method was uh, our, our lecture yesterday. It is something which gives you a visual idea what you have to do at this, in the surgery room that you get a perfect result at the end. It is something which you have to learn. If you do it sometimes, you will see it helps you a lot to have always a good result. The surgical method is minimal invasive. The longest cut we need is about two centimeters. And what you can see here, these tubes, which were inserted into the, uh, through the joint, into the bone, they help us to prevent uh, getting any blood or bone debris into the joint. So the joint is clear after the procedure. Here you see our uh, shunt screw, which we use to control torsion of the, the leg, all these things together make the surgery minimal invasive. So this is the most common what, way what we do. We normally uh, uh, treat both bones. We have about 100 surgeries like this every year. We put one nail up, one nail down, and we can correct the alignment of the leg. We can correct the length. And that is something <coughs> which is very good. For example, as, as such a case, you can see here, it's a young lady is having six centimeters if you want not only to lengthen her one bone, you want also to have the knee joint at the same level, you want to correct this slight valgus deformity, then you make a skin cut like this, a transverse cut, and you make your planning, you put in the nails, and then the nails will distract simultaneously one millimeter each bone every day, and then you get good bone, and you take off these nails, you must take off these nails, about one year or maybe one year and a half year after the surgery. And always you have to make long x-rays, long standing x-rays to control the mechanical axis before and after treatment. And the cosmetic results using such a device are really good. So that is something what we would say that's the regular daily procedure, what we do. And now I will come to these, let's say, special procedures which are a little bit more problematic. For example, this achondroplasia, as you know, you can't read as well, but these bones are very short. The joints are very unstable. You can do, but you need very short nails for, because you have to bring them initially in and you must take care to the joints because uh, they are not, have not the same stability as normal joints. Another thing is like something like this. If you want to do that, cosmetic lengthening you can do as well. But I recommend to do it only if you are experienced in conventional cases because these people come from full healthiness and if you don't do a really good job, it cannot be better at, as, at, it is at the beginning. It cannot be longer or maybe you create some deformity. Much more interested for us is something like this, having complex deformities. In earlier times, we would say it's not so easy to... Uh, correct this with a nail, but as you are experienced now, you see, it is very easy. You correct this deformity acutely, you bring in a lengthening nail and you lengthen that girl. It was a double osteotomy, as you can see here. So you get a result like this, and you can see her running very carefully the first steps, and uh, that is something which makes us happy then. That was a girl from Russia, treated, uh, was treated by a lizard fixator, and she was unhappy about this situation. You can perform bone transport. If you have a situation like this, normally these patients are operated several times again and again. You put bone crafting and try to, uh, to get some uh, continu continuity, but always you get fracturing of the plate or a nail or whatever. So I think best make a cut and try to find one uh, biological solution. Sometimes it's hard to throw away all this little bone, what you have, but if you decided to make a good cut and a good bone afterwards, I think then the thing is done and the patient will be back to work afterwards. So we do that with a nail as well and you can see Fitbone can do that in the same way that it's the same way as you do uh, lengthen, you can perform bone transport. The humerus is a nice bone to lengthen. If it's long enough, it is good. The problem is that the, it gets really flat here, so normally the nail has to end here. But we have observed in comparison with the monolateral fixator that the function is really good, even if you go through the rotator cuff here. You can make uh, excellent, can get excellent results. It's an easy surgery. 
as you know, humerus is healing very well, and um, so you, you get good bone all around and look to the function, that's fine. And the, the, what my, uh, um, my observation is that the pain level of those patients is really low. So that's all about lengthening bones at the moment. But we have also other problems. For example, this. We had already yesterday some solutions about something like this. Do you see the bone? The leg is short, but the bone is not short. You have this real problematic situation in a young lady after trauma. So the hip is in a place where it should not be. You cannot distract her acutely. Everybody knows you get nerve problems. So why not using a full implantable system, not making the bone longer, but making the leg longer, stretching the nerve continuously so that you, uh, you can, intraoperatively, you can distract maybe about two centimeters, but you should not do more, and the rest you do postoperatively in the same way as you do it um, <coughs> for lengthening. You see this fit bone device upside down in this patient, uh, and at the end you can perform hip replacement in the anatomical position without any external fixation and um, that has the advantage that the long time result can be expected much better. It's not only for good, good for young people, that is our oldest pe uh, man here, all his life he could walk like this but now he gets painful what to do in this such a situation. It's the same problem. I think it's not a good idea to shorten the bone or take off a part. Don't forget the gluteus medius. You need the function. You don't want a trendalian bone. You don't want a nerve problem. So better distract him gradually, as you can see here with the nail, and then perform this hip arthroplasty in the normal way. And then you can expect that he has a normal um, uh, uh, gait like this. What about... Tumor surgery, you know they can do uh, lengthen the tumor prosthesis. That is uh, a way different types of tumor prosthesis can be lengthened. If you have a motor device, you can, you see all these parts of the fit bone now in a tumor prosthesis. And you can lengthen it, also minimal invasive, activating this motor. This is an example. You see this boy before and afterwards. He was lengthened about three centimeters. And so I think that is the solution, but you lengthen the device and you lengthen not the bone. That means the more you lengthen, the, world, the much more problematic becomes relationship from prosthesis to bone. If you lengthen a lot and finally the bone is only like this, it's not good. So the idea was not to lengthen the device, but to lengthen the bone again. So we combined the nail with the prosthesis and we lengthen, as you have seen in the other examples, the bone. If you do that, you can get a better relationship from bone to prosthesis. And that, I think that is the future because for all these two more patients, you can get very good results that is available for all these frequent locations of malignant bone tumors. I want to show you only one example. As you can see here, this girl who was uh, treated because of an osteosarcoma. She developed a limb length discrepancy, so the femur was cut again uh, and the healthy part, and we lengthen her, as you can see here on the right side. So at the end, she has two equal uh, length, length the, the leg length was equal on, on both sides, and her gait was more or less normal. So that is very fast some ideas about that what you can do with a, with a fit bone device in the different, different parts of orthopedic surgery. I had the chance to go back to Kurgan in 2016 and I met Elizabeth again several years after his death and you can see he asked me to get the fit bone. I, I, I brought him one. So he's happy now. We are thinking about uh, making a deformity course Europe. We are a very small group in Germany, as you are. Maybe we, for the future we can also do something together, if you like. We, I think for the future we should talk about external fixation 
in a, and about internal fixation and uh, have a structure which could be helpful for beginners and for advanced users as well. And uh, I'm very happy to be here in this course, which seemed to be very successful for me and a very good audience and very good organization. So I think that is first part. I stop here. Should be in time. <laughs> Thank you. Some questions here? No questions? Everything clear or everything unclear? <laughs> yes? No question. You, you said us that you always have to remove the bail. Yes. How do you remove it from the prosthesis nail combo? From where? Prosthesis nail combo. Yes. I think, um, let's say, that, uh, that's a principal question. I, my opinion is that all nails, it doesn't matter if it's a lengthening nail, it's detained, whatever, in the lower leg has to be removed. Because if you let something inside and the patient needs later on, if it's old, a knee replacement, and you know people nowadays become old, the young generation has life expectancy of, let's say, 100 years, so the percentage getting a knee or hip replacement is high. We are all not living anymore when they need a knee replacement. And then people can go and look to take something out. That is a principal remark for the nail removal. But your question was in the prosthesis. I think these nails having uh, electronic parts in, inside our motor, that should not, they are not designed for long-term stability. They have to be removed. And the, so we, we put in a regular uh, coated stem making bone in close. I think that is the mandatory final procedure we do in, in all cases. Yes? Yeah. 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 Why, why, why difficult? What, what was difficult? Well, uh, because of the valgus and focal bone and the bone we were replacing the uh, protective muscles, we found that this nail would deform or subtract or the marker over and weld the joints together. So, so you, you are concerned that you get a valgus or varus deformity during lengthening? Yes. Yeah. I think the first thing is you must do the planning in the right way so that normally the tibia is lengthened along the mechanical axis. It should not be a problem. What you should look for in your case is if you fix the nail enough. We uh, try to fix the nail with additional blocking or polo screws. So under the tension of the fascia lata, you have the tendency that the, the leg goes to lateral. And you have to prevent that if you have not a good bone quality with additional screws. And uh, maybe this is the reason we observed not this problem. What we ob are observing that principally the bone growth around the nail is not the same as with an external fixator. So our rate making some bone crafting is a little bit higher using a nail. But that has nothing to do with the implant or a precise nail. That's something with the principle that you really, as Elizabeth teaches us, you destroy the intramedullary vessels, so one part of the blood supply, so you have only the other one, and that makes some increase, a decrease of uh, bone formation. But in comparison to the other advantages you have, it is a very low problem. More questions? No? Continue with the next. Huh? So the next uh, talk I shorten a little bit. I want to talk only about um, uh, some principles, and I think a lot of things were already mentioned, so I can go through that uh, through that uh, very fast. Um, today we have the, not the topic of lengthening nails, but the topic of uh, deformities. But again, I want to mention that that is always the goal. Before you don't know what is the problem of the whole patient of the, of, the, of the leg before you do not ha have done a full long-standing radiograph. You, can, you should never start an osteotomy. My teacher made only one bone and he said, oh, that's a varus, a valgus. Valgus were cut here, varus were cut here. So that was, that's old-fashioned, let's say. We should not do that. We should analyze everything before. And the next question is, what kind of osteotomy you would do. If you use a saw and cut the bone with a saw, if you decided to do that, I think it makes sense to use a plate as well. 
it makes no sense to make a big cut for the saw and then you close that and make another cut for the nail away so you have two bone cuts. It makes not much sense. When we want to use a nail, we use this kind of osteotomy here in the mid shaft or here in the diaphys uh, close to the joint. Then we have a small incision for the osteotomy and then we do another incision for the nail. I want to show that in an example that is a supracondylar deformity without shortening. I said supracondylar, but we don't know that at the moment. We see only this, this man has a virus, as you can see, very clear. Okay, so to know what's happening, we always have to measure all these values which you have learned during the last two days. And as you can see here, that is, that is our um, uh, way how we uh, document it. There's only little limb length discrepancy, only four millimeters, but you see here on the left side, the mechanical axis is 26 millimeters medial of the knee joint center. And what you can see here, the tibia angle is on this side is normal, and here, it is out of range at the distal femur. So you have to do a distal femur osteotomy. And at that, in this case, we decided to do it with a saw and to use this. We use the Tomofix plate. You can do another plate, whatever you like. But I think that is one standard procedure which you can use if you want and which is easy to do. Let's look to another situation. What happens if something like this is the case? So you have a combined problem. I will show you the case. This is a young lady from Arabian countries. He, she was treated, uh, her, the valgus was treated on the left side already before in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, but she was unhappy with this treatment. <laughs> As you will see, it, is, it was a little bit better maybe, but she saw it's not good. So for the other leg, she traveled abroad and we analyzed her and you can see that on the right side, the, it, was still, it was 90 millimeters medial of the center, on the left side still 68. And you see all these values all around the knee joint were pathological. Supra, there was above the knee joint, below the knee joint. So you cannot treat that with one single bone cut above or below the knee joint. Again, here we decided to use a saw and uh, that was for us also a situation which could be treated in a normal conventional way using two plates and more or less center this uh, lady. So I think this side is good now and now she will come for the other as well. So that is <coughs> something which you can do with plates. Okay, but when you have something like this, that is a deformity and that is very frequently occurs that you have, especially in children, something which is short and deformed. And uh, we discussed this already yesterday. The, the, the distal femur cross plate is the most active cross plate of the lower leg. 60% of the cross coming from there. So, the, and if some damage occurs around that cross plate, you get the deformity is always here. And in addition, you get shortening. So it makes sense to make the correction here and not anywhere else, okay? So it will not help you if you prefer the discussion of what is better, a retrograde or antegrade approach for making deformity correction and lengthening. If you have an implant which can reach this deformity from antegrade, you can use that, but you cannot use it and you cannot use, um, solve the problem with one osteotomy if you cannot reach the area where the apex of the deformity is located. Look to such a case. You see this is short, three centimeters. You can see here there is a valgus deformity. And if you analyze it in the same way, you can see three centimeters shortening and the the, the, the 28 millimeters lateral at the level of the knee joint and the deformity is not at the tibia, it is at the same point where the shorter, uh, where um, the, no, it's, it's um, in supracondylar region, okay? So here it is a good indication to make these uh, whole osteotomies, cut the bone here and then of course you know what's coming now, we put in a fit bone of course and lengthen her in combination with the axis uh, correction, you see this block screw here that 
helps us to get this uh, de uh, deformity fixed because that is what we control intraoperatively and that should um, stay during the time of lengthening and also afterwards when the nail is removed. I think that is an, a good example having uh, shortening in combination with the deformity and um, something similar like this you can see here that is as you see also that just from the clinical view shortening and valgus uh, varus deformation you always making the same analysis more or less equal a little bit more varus as you can see here located in the distal femur as well you make the osteocyl bit osteotomy, put in a, a nail like this and get a result like this. That is something very reproducible and we discussed it already yesterday. If you do these deformities frequently, you need a very low percentage of luck. You need a high percentage of uh, guaranteed um, success. This case we had in our... Uh, um, uh, case discussions yesterday and no recommendation without exception. You see this is, um, there was a young uh, man having this severe deformity which is located supracondylar as you can see here that is his enchondromatosis case and uh, the compensation. So the alignment was not so bad overall but um, he had uh, these uh, problems if you see the knee joint lined you will, you will see that uh, you cannot leave it like this. And uh, we, in this case, we used a saw, even if we used the nail, because in this case we have to, res our planning says we want to resect this part of the bone, not to over tension it acutely. And uh, we put this nail together, uh, these bones together. Uh, with an uh, anti-crate fit bone nail which is, has some special locking it abilities what you can see here so first of all we restore the knee joint orientation and our, our philosophy was if we can lengthen afterwards in a safe way we can make him shorter a little bit during the surgery because that is not uh, much difference afterwards to make half centimeter or something like this more so that was solved intraoperatively and you can see already here that is in this case there was um, a frame used because this huge valgus deformity which is coming out at that moment when you correct the, the femur then this valgus deformity is coming out you see here the position of the patella that is the axis of the femur so that was compensated before by the deformity of the femur now that's coming out and you see here this big um, malorientation of the tibia. So at the end you get a result like this. The femur can be lengthened and aligned and also after removal of the frame the tibia as well. So you have these different stages of the patient. Meanwhile the other leg was corrected as well. So you, you get a full alignment using different methods together and coming to this important picture with this device. Using this method which we learned yesterday and with that I want to say thank you very much.